Welcome to Flip Your Lid with Kim Honeycutt. Kim is a psychotherapist and executive director of ICU Talks, a mental health speaking ministry. This is a podcast about how to flip your lid and learning how to reconnect to who you really are. Okay, everybody. We were about to go really, really deep with a profound woman who's had so much happen to her. But more than that, she has repurposed that pain and helped so many people. Let me tell you about Julie Owens. She's a survivor of domestic violence. She's worked in the field of violence against women and women's empowerment since 1989. She's founded a hospital DV crisis response team, a transitional shelter, advocacy groups, and training program. She's worked with trauma survivors and addicted survivors and was a research co-investigator, project director, and trauma therapist on studies at the National Center for PTSD. She trains professionals widely and has served as an expert witness in both criminal and civil cases regarding domestic violence and domestic violence related to post-traumatic stress disorder. She was a site coordinator for the Lilly Endowment Funded RAVE Project, RAVE stands for Religion and Violence E-Learning, during its five years of initial development. Her extensive work with the State of North Carolina Department of Administration, North Carolina Council for Women, involved oversight of numerous domestic violence, sexual assault, and economic and empowerment grant programs. She monitored grants, developed grant guidelines, trained nonprofit boards, consulted and trained about best practice when working with victims and survivors. She's built collaborative initiatives, and she's partnered with professionals in many disciplines, and she's here today with us. (laughs) Julie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me, Kim. I'm excited to be here, and Welcome, everyone who is watching. Yeah, and I I know you're going to flip their lid with your expertise and your incredible (laughs) compassion. But just to start off, we start off the same with everybody. Can you share a little bit about your life event, your experience that flipped your lid, and talk about what measures you took to reconnect to who God says you are? Sure. Well, I uh, first of all, I grew up in a great home. Uh, I, I was one of those lucky people. Right. My, I had wonderful parents. My dad was a pastor, mm-hmm. and um, we there were five kids in the family. I, I really didn't know about domestic violence. I I think I had all the same stereotypes that I think everybody out there who hasn't been there does. Mm-hmm. You know, you think it's it's certain kinds of people, and you just mm-hmm. I really mm-hmm. didn't understand it at all. But but um, I. I had traveled, I had gone to college, I had done all this stuff, and I thought I was fairly sophisticated or, you know, but I didn't know about it. And I didn't get married till I was 32. That makes and you smart, I, very smart. Well, except who except I married. For who you married. <laughs> I'm, I was really smart when I married the one I'm married to now. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, he was never abusive when we were dating. He mm-hmm. was, he was, you know, wonderful. And this is very typical, of mm-hmm. course. And mm-hmm. so, uh, but as soon as we got married, literally the night uh, we got married, he started being very um, jealous and pr- it, it escalated extremely quickly. So what I experienced was real uh, psychological abuse, co- uh, co- what we call coercive control, a lot of, um, uh, and a, a lot of co- trying to control me, take my car keys away, rip mm. the spark plugs out of my car so I couldn't go somewhere. We lived out in the country. We were in Texas, actually. And um, I really didn't know what to make of it, except that he was in recovery. And I thought it had to be related to, you know, his addiction issues Mm -hmm. and mental health issues, which uh, at the time I didn't know much about. And so I went to an Al-Anon group and Mm -hmm. they just would say things like, you know, just see the word sick flesh it on his forehead. You know, if he calls you Mm -hmm. a chair, does it make you a chair? You know, so nobody really understood that this was domestic violence, that it was a pattern and it was increasing in frequency and severity. It was escalating and it was going to get really dangerous. But, but, you know, nobody told me that. So I went and I talked to pastors, the pastor who married us. Uh, I became pregnant two weeks after the wedding, if you could believe that. I wow. even talked to my OBGYN about it. So keep in mind, he never hit me. Right. Never, never hit me. And But the uh, accusations of infidelity, you know, calling me names, mm-hmm. uh, smashing the wall, 
ripping the phones out of the wall. At the time, we had those kinds of phones. I didn't, and there wasn't cell phones. And uh, I just really, I was so flabbergasted. I was, I just, but nobody named it. Nobody said this is domestic violence and it's going to get worse. Nobody said any of those things. So um, after just three months of being married, I, I couldn't take it anymore. He was, he was just acting crazy and it was, he, he would go out. And now I know he was mm-hmm. using, at the time I didn't know that. I never saw him use, I never saw him drink. Right. But um, long story short, I, he went to work one day and I took off. I did, he came home and I was gone and most of my stuff was too. I disappeared. And I went home actually to Hawaii where my dad was a pastor of a church and where I had uh, moved from. I went back. I had gone from Texas to Hawaii and then wow. back to Texas. And um we were separated for three months, and I saw uh, counselors, psychologists, and talked to lots of pastors, and still nobody named it or mm-hmm. sent me to the right place that could have helped me, that could have named it for me, and could have helped me safety plan and so forth and so on. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it's just to kind of make a long story short, we reconciled after three months. And of course, everything was great at first. And then it started right up again and continued to escalate until uh, when the baby was born, uh, things were a little bit better. But by the time the baby was eight months old, things were just, it was torture. It was really torture. Sleep deprivation, mm-hmm. keeping me up all night, harassing me and accusing me of things. And it was it was a nightmare. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, I, I just felt like I didn't have any choice but to file for divorce. And, I, and so I told him that's what I was going to do. And um, he, he, he held me at knife point. He mm-hmm. kidnapped me basically all night long, threatening to kill me, kill my father. He told me that if I left him, he was going to kill my father, cut his eyes out. Wow. Uh, wow. All the stuff he was going to do. Very specific and I was really afraid, but um, I, re- I didn't know what to do. Uh, and I just thought if we could just keep him calm. I mean, we act- I actually went to our marriage counselor who was a, uh, she was a psychotherapist. Uh, and I said, can, you, can he get on an abuse or something? Because I thought, right. you know, maybe right. that's why he's doing it, right? right? And if we could keep him sober, maybe he wouldn't hurt anybody. And I didn't want to go to a shelter uh, even though nobody was really talking about one because I didn't want to leave my family because he was threatening my dad because I was staying with my parents. So um, anyway, after after he finally did move out uh, when I filed for divorce about a week later, but it was like less than two weeks later when uh, everything really blew up and uh, mm-hmm. I came home to a darkened house and he was waiting. He had broken in and was waiting uh, and he <clears throat> me and he, beat me up really badly. He had a knife. He said, um, I'm going to, I'm going to kill your father. I'm going to cut his eyes out. I told you I was going to do this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he held the knife sticking in my neck, in my throat so that I couldn't warn my dad. And my dad walked into the ambush and we both, uh, and it was just one of those fights for our lives. It, the kind of stuff you see in movies, literally, mm-hmm. uh, I got, he stabbed me in the stomach. He, he almost cut dad's eyes out. He cut him, uh, through the eyebrows he had over 40 stitches, but somehow dad managed to, um, to uh, sort of pin him up against the wall in the darkened hallway where he had walked in and gotten ambushed. And, and right in the midst of this, I'll just say, I, I I really did not know what to do. And I heard a voice say, turn on the lights when he sees what he's done, he'll run. And I ran to the end of the hallway. I turned on the light. He took one look at us, covered with blood, and he ran. Wow. Wow. And that was the beginning of this 30-some-odd-year journey now. Mm -hmm. Um, When I did get to a support group for victims of domestic violence, which wasn't immediate, the the hospital didn't know how to help me. That's why I started a hospital crisis team for victims in emergency Mm -hmm. rooms. Uh, but when I did get there and I sat at this table with all these other women, different ages, ethnicities, 
lives, lives, you know, lifestyles. Mm-hmm. It was like we, uh, I said, are we all married to the same man? It was like we were telling the same story, yes, just yes, yes. different details. But, and some of the others, you know, they, their uh, husbands or boyfriends, abusers, whoever had substance use issues and others didn't. But uh, what happened is I got, it was very empowering, uh, mm-hmm. the sisterhood that developed in this support group. And the facilitator was so skilled and so good. She's one of my best friends to this day. <laughs> And, and she gave me a little book um, called Keeping the Faith, Questions and Answers for Abused Christian Women by mm-hmm. Reverend Marie Fortune. Um, and I learned things that I didn't know uh, about uh, abuse that uh, it, that actually he had broken the marriage covenant, that if by divorcing or leaving or ending the relationship, I wasn't doing anything that I shouldn't do. I was just making it public because he had already broken the covenant. Right. And, um, and a lot about forgiveness, you know, cause growing up in the church, you, you have, there's a lot of, uh, you're taught a lot of things like forgive 70 times seven, right? you know, right. and at the time it was, uh, I, I, I guess I, I was raised in the South, first of all. So a lot of real uh, traditional structure of a family mm-hmm. and, and in the church, uh, you know, that's a lot of times it's really taught the hierarchy in the family, yes. which I now know is really not even biblical. It's mistranslation, but, and that's something that I talk about a lot now. Anyway, uh, I did get, I ended up getting the divorce and I went back to school and I uh, studied violence against women. And wow. I learned a lot and I started an activist group and we would march and we would protest and we would uh, testify, get laws passed and all that kind of thing. And then I ended up uh, working in the field in all these different capacities, mm-hmm. as you know. And our church started a transitional shelter for abused women and children. Mm-hmm. And also I managed it. And um we started an interfaith coalition. So we brought together faith leaders from different religions and uh, to get educated and to right, learn to right. do the right thing. Because yeah. I found out that one out of three women is abused in our intimate relationship mm-hmm. and that uh, our church was full of them and nobody knew it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, we didn't know it. But when dad got up in the pulpit and started talking about it, they started coming to us. And so we we knew that it was much bigger than us, you know, and that really yeah. there was going to be a purpose to this. And yeah. so, you know, Dad and I ended up doing a lot of training and teaching and writing together over the years. You know, I've heard so many similar stories over my 20 years in this field and friends and patients, different stuff. And it it's still always that physiological reaction that I have to it. You know, just the idea of having to go through that much and for your father to be victimized by this man as well. And then how God repurposes. It's beautiful. Well, you know, and it's so where this took me, this journey is something I could not have even dreamed of. Mm -hmm. Uh, I he stalked me for years from prison. He went to prison, but even from there, I would get death threats. I had to move, change my phone number. Mm -hmm. I I had to go underground essentially for years. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I was always living in fear that he was going to get out and do something. Of course I had his son and he had, when I had been in court, he had yelled, I want my son, you know, and I knew Mm -hmm. that he it was his only son that he was really going to try to punish me because he blamed us, my family and all, you know, for everything. Of course, didn't take any responsibility, right, right, which, which is, is pretty typical. <laughs> very common narcissistic trait is the blame and the deflection. And But this is so s- severe. I mean, think about it. I know you've worked with a lot of women. I have too. That because it didn't become physical, because there was no cutting and beating, the 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 man who did it doesn't go to jail, doesn't, there's no well, yeah. ramifications. 
Well, and that's why now today we talk a lot about coercive control and we're mm. working to get laws against coercive control yes. passed because it's not just what they do to you. It's what they take from you. They yeah. take your freedom. They take they your go. autonomy. They take mm-hmm. your 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 human rights. Mm-hmm. Where well, you, know, you can live, your sense of freedom, you're, you're living every, in trauma response constantly. Really, completely. It's, like, it's, it's really like a hostage situation. It and is. I, and you hear, you hear people, you know, often say about, you know, alcoholics or, or people with addictions that, you know, they don't, they don't have relationship. They take hostages. Well, mm-hmm. in the case of domestic violence, it really is true. It, I mean, yeah. uh, it's not hyperbole. Uh, it is, it is absolutely true. And it can happen to anybody. It, it doesn't have anything to do with how smart you are, how intelli- you know, how educated you are. Nothing, nothing right. it has nothing to do with race, ethnicity, religion, right. none right. of that. It can happen to anybody. It's very random and, and it happens slowly. And I think, uh, for me, and I think for a lot of other women that I've known, uh, the pity for him is one of the big traps. And without being able to really see and internalize the reality that he's doing this because he can, and he's making a choice to do this, this is not something he doesn't have control of, right. that he's he's not doing it to the neighbors. You know, he gets just mm-hmm. as high with his friends and doesn't do it to them. Right. So, you know, all of those myths, I had all of those myths and I didn't understand it, but as I really got educated about it and I understood it and realized how huge the problem was, I really felt compelled to help other women who were in that situation and to try to, you know, make a difference. And so that's what kind of led me into all these other things. But what what I wanted to say is after living in fear for all many, many years, when my son was 25 years old, he had never met his father. He hadn't seen him since he was eight months old when this all happened. And I found out that he was dying in prison, my son's father. And I had to make, I I knew I had to give him the opportunity to meet his father before he died if he wanted to. Now, this is not something that I would have ever recommended to any victim of domestic violence or survivor or attempted Mm -hmm. murder or anything. Go to the prison and meet. No, that's not a good idea. But because he was dying and he was in a prison hospice, I knew that it would be safe. And I thought, well, if my son needs it, because he has a lot of a lot of psychological problems. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we made the trip and we did it. We went to see him and we spent two afternoons with him. And it, what it taught me was that, you know, I had worked all these decades for justice which I believe in, but, you know, Jesus came to set the captives free That's right. and, and everyone deserves justice, but I learned mercy too. And mm. that was a very powerful lesson for me mm. because I fully expected that he was going to be the same person he was when he did it. And actually he wasn't, which shocked me because he said it was all my fault. I was mean, I was jealous you were a yeah. great wife, you know, wow. and uh, and it's because he had had a very spiritual experience in prison. Mm-hmm. He lost everything, right? Yeah. So he he humbled himself before God. It's a different level of freedom for you when you saw that. To- it totally was because yeah. it was a different ending to my story, if you will, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And uh, it's not that I I had I had never hated him. I had always feared him and felt sorry for him and all of that, and didn't want, ever want to see him again. But I knew he was a very damaged person. I knew about his childhood. I knew mm-hmm. what had led to him having the problems that he had and being the person that he, that he was. And so, uh, I mean, I have a. I just feel like it was a real gift. A lot of people don't understand why I would have done something like that, but I was really led to do it. I I knew I was supposed to do it and that it was going to be good. Yeah. Uh, And uh, I I got a lot of signs from God along the way, Uh, really interesting signs so that I knew it would. I'll just give you an example. My son and I drove. We drove to Texas. He was in prison in Texas. And as soon as we went, as soon as we crossed over the state line to Texas, I said, okay, it's time to listen to some Texas music now. You've never really heard this. And <laughs> you know, this is where you got your start. Cause you know, that's where I had conceived him. Right. Mm-hmm. And he had never lived there though, because I fled and went back to Hawaii. So I said, you're going to listen, we're going to listen to country music. And so 
of course, he was very conflicted about. We didn't know what, what David was going to say or do because we had had no contact with him except to say he had put us on the list to co- and we could we could visit. We didn't know where his head was or anything. Mm. But I was convinced that it was going to be good. But anyway, we t- I tur- so I turned on the radio. Literally, the second I turned on the radio, the first thing I heard was Kenny Rogers singing, Promise me, son, not to do the things I've done. Ooh. Oh, if you can. It don't mean you're weak if you turn the other cheek, son. You don't have to fight to be a man. And things like that happened yeah. all along the way. And they were like stepping stones. They were like guideposts so that I knew that, you know, I was doing what I was, I, I was supposed to do. And what it ended up being was a gift to me, right. a gift to my son, yeah. and a gift to David. Right. And you thought initially, and that's so so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that part. But you thought yeah. initially you were going for your son, and it was really I, yes. for all parties involved. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's, it's, it's such a prodigal son story. It is. And, uh, you know, and now my son, we got to take one picture. They said you can ha- take one photograph. And so I said, okay, Josh said it needs to be you and your dad. And so uh, they took a Polaroid and they gave it to him and he has it sitting by his bed. And mm-hmm. we uh, communicated with him for the last few months of his life before he died. Yeah. And uh, he's got letters from his father. He now knows who he Mm-hmm. who he was, and he felt like he knew him a little bit. He had right. changed his identity. Yeah, what a, gift. Mm-hmm. what a gift. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's always a lot of, um, you know, as a, as a young survivor, as a new survivor, I sort of resented the word forgiveness. I, I didn't want anybody to talk to me about it because I didn't understand it. Um, because it wasn't okay what he had done, and he hadn't repented or apologized or, you know, there, so I didn't feel like there was any place for it. Um, but as I uh, kind of experienced a little post-traumatic growth, as we call it now, uh, and learned a lot and was mentored by other survivors who had, uh, and mentors like Marie Fortune, uh, I came to learn that it wasn't what I thought it was. And so really it was, it was work that I needed to do. And it was, it was more about just um, really not focusing, not making that my focus anymore Mm -hmm. and uh, focusing on him really what it did so by forgiving him I mean I guess you could call it a lot of things letting go setting myself free uh uh, I felt like he um he didn't control me anymore Mm. and so it was very powerful uh to do that and what's interesting is when I saw him at prison it's like the the first thing I said to him was, do you remember what you did? Mm. And he said, uh, I remember some and I've read other. I said, let me tell you. Wow. So I wow. all out. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't going to start anywhere else. And the first thing he said was, do you forgive me? I couldn't oh. believe he had the nerve to even ask that. Right. And then I said, yeah, David, I did a long time ago. Mm. Not for you. That's right. <laughs> but but for me. Yeah. And, and you got to say uh, that clearly to him that it wasn't for him. It was for I needed for you. to do that. Right. Yeah. But uh it just seemed odd that he would ask. I guess there was something that made that was really important for him. Mm. But uh but I was okay with it. Yeah. Uh, and uh I've talked to a lot of survivors over the years about this. And I think the church and People in general are just very eager to have survivors forgive uh, mm-hmm. because they believe that that's what they should do. And my philosophy about it is nobody, a victim shouldn't have to do anything. They didn't commit a crime. Yeah. I mean, they Julie, didn't do say, anything wrong. say that again. Say it again for people. <laughs> Victims are innocent. Mm-hmm. And they don't need to be mandated to do anything, right? Uh, that's right. To, to say anything, to do anything. I, uh, I think 
victims and survivors are re-victimized over and over and over by society, Mm -hmm. by people who um, think they have the moral high ground, by Mm -hmm. systems, uh, and and we don't have any right to tell a survivor what to do or when to do it. In fact, Mm -hmm. my my kind of North star when it comes to being an advocate is don't give advice. I yeah. never give advice because right. as far as I know, my advice could get somebody killed. That's I don't right. know what somebody else needs to do. Mm-hmm. So my role is to believe them, support them, refer them to places that might be able to help them to resources, give them information, educate, um, and it's not my job to tell anybody what I think they should do or what's in their mm-hmm. best interest. Cause I don't know. Cause what's, mm-hmm. what's best for one person isn't best for the next one person may uh, call the police and their abuser gets arrested. And that's great. And that, and that helps them. Well, another one might call the police and she gets arrested. That's right. Or, that's right. Uh, she gets deported or mm-hmm. she loses custody of her kids because the tables get turned on her by mm-hmm. child protective services or the family court or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't want to tell anybody what to do. I could just say what worked for me, what mm-hmm. I have found to be helpful. Mm-hmm. And um, then, you know, and I'm happy to to talk about, you know, my own experience and things that I think might be helpful, but I'm I'm pretty adamant about that. I know a lot of people don't agree with me, but having um, gotten a lot of advice that yes. was unsolicited and yes. some that was really bad, yes, uh, that's kind of where I've landed. <laughs> and speaking of really bad, uh, when I went, I went. I told you I went and filed for divorce, right? And then mm-hmm. this happened. The big. Uh, uh, assault happened right after that. And I went back to the same attorney who I had asked at the time, should I try to get a protective order or something like that? He said, nah, there's laws against assault. And so I didn't, I don't know that it would have helped anyway, but it was uh, because sometimes they help and sometimes they hurt. Sometimes Mm -hmm. they don't do anything. Mm -hmm. But um, when I went back and I said, well, guess what happened? (laughs) And I told him, and he said, first thing he said is, you should take the baby to the prison to see him. A bad, a bad father is better than no father at all. Wow. Wow. I, I, yeah. That, that could not be more victim blaming. Yeah. That's the day he got fired. <laughs> yeah. And self indulgent. How self indulgent? Uh, yeah. How uh, really arrogant. Right. Uh, and, yeah. And I knew that wasn't in my baby's best interest, but I tell you, that was my hardest decision I had to make. I mm-hmm. I knew there was, I had to make a decision one way or the other. I, he, David was either going to be in my child's life or not. There was no in between. Right. And I was to take a baby to prison to mm-hmm. see a father who was dangerous mm-hmm. or he wasn't going to have a father. And I And I felt like... I was kind of damned if I do, damned if I don't. And I feel that way about most most victims and survivors who are mothers. They are because you get blamed for screwing up your kid if you mm-hmm. uh, keep the father in their life and you get blamed for screwing up the kid if you don't. It, right, it, right. it doesn't matter what we do as women. There's so much bias and prejudice against us for the things that we do, especially as survivors of crime, because people always want to think that they would have done things differently. Somehow they're smarter, you know, that that they wouldn't make the same choices we did. Victim blaming is so rampant, but, um, but I I had to make a decision and that's where I landed was he wasn't going to be in his life at all. And, um, and I, I, I do think it's, it's made his life difficult, but I think it would have been as difficult or more difficult if I'd done it the other way. So, you know, it, yeah. you, just, you just have to go with your gut and do what you think is going to be in their long-term best interest. And I, that's where I was trying to focus. What are my, what are my long-term best interests? Not to make decisions based on my feelings, but on just the facts, what I knew. And I knew he was really dangerous and yes. it didn't make sense. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And you said some really strong things. And one is that you said, I believe them. 
Yes. And that some of the best things we can do is validate somebody where they are and believe what they are saying. Always uh, start by believing. Always, always. always. And, and, and the question yeah. is to not ask, like, <laughs> why, did, why did you wait so long? Why did you stay? Yeah, those what aren't questions. You, those are judgments. Yeah. That's right. They're just disguised. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, and, you know, I, I think victim blaming is so, uh, it's so endemic. It's so embedded in our society that mm-hmm. it's, especially when it comes to women. I mean, mm-hmm. if you get abused, it's, you know, what'd you do to make him so mad? Why did you yeah. stay? Why did you marry him? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you get raped, is what were you wearing? Why were, were you, you drinking? walking alone? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you mm-hmm. were drinking, then, oh, well, you know, then right. that's why you got raped, which is ridiculous because right. the only thing that causes rape is uh, men who decide to rape. Right. And the only thing that causes domestic violence is a partner who decides to be abusive. Right. You know, and but I I don't think society in general is comfortable with that because they feel safer in the world if they can think that, well, I wouldn't do things that way. So I'm it won't happen to me. Right. Right? Yeah. I I, I heard this uh, comedian once. And and I thought about what he said. Uh, He was he said, what was Pearl Harbor doing in the Pacific that day? And it, I, and it was so ludicrous. Yeah, that's yeah. The, but that's, victim that's blaming great. is totally yeah. ludicrous. Right, right. If we right. knew what was going to happen, do you think we would have been there? Right. You know, it's it's just ridiculous. And so, the the work that I did at the National Center for PTSD, the two studies that I was the dir- director on, uh, it, the therapy was about dismantling trauma related guilt. Mm-hmm. Because we found that with survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault or sex trafficking, those kinds of things, really the uh, guilt becomes uh, one of the linchpins that keeps that PTSD really uh, entrenched. And particularly if they're mothers. So if they had mm-hmm. children and they they blame themselves for their kids being messed up or Mm -hmm. their kids not having a father or whatever. So uh, I was very fortunate to be mentored and taught by a very brilliant uh, trauma specialist, uh, psychotherapist who taught uh, me to do the therapy exactly Mm -hmm. as he did it. I'm I'm, uh, studied with him, watched through the, uh, through a two-way mirror. Uh, It was a lot, a lot of training. But the point was to find out if advocates who weren't clinicians Mm -hmm. could do this because it's cognitive behavioral stuff, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. it's with survivors and it's partnering with them. So uh, it was more like sitting and talking and teaching and sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, And it gave them the opportunity to really uh, think back and kind of put themselves back in their head where they were back then and why they made the choices that they did at the time and what other things they entertained or didn't entertain. Mm -hmm. Because uh, trauma-related guilt has all these different pieces, as I learned. There's hindsight bias, you know, that Monday Mm -hmm. morning quarterbacking, coulda, shoulda, woulda stuff, you know, shooting all over itself. And, um, then there's uh, these beliefs that what I did, I wasn't justified uh, there, or that and what I did was wrong. Somehow I, I, I sinned or I, I did something wrong or and uh, I was responsible. So there are all these pieces. So each one of them, we had to analyze them and sort of break them down. And it was really interesting to me because uh, we would have survivors make a list of everything outside of themselves that led to this event or series of events or this thing that they felt guilty about. First, we did a trauma history assessment that we developed. And then we would rank the most traumatic events, the ones that were the most problematic for the person, you know, the ones that were keeping them up at night and stuff or causing the nightmares or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we'd start at the top and and work our way down and um, it would start to generalize. But, 
what we found was that because they felt so bad about what had happened, that they they took that feeling as evidence that their thinking about it was correct. Right. <laughs> so, you know, just just like with I know you worked a lot on shame, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just like say, you know, I'm di- I'm dirty, I'm bad, mm-hmm. I'm 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 not worthy, and all all those kinds of thoughts. We know those aren't true. That they, uh, but they're connected to feelings that are really uncomfortable. And right, so right. we tried to help them separate the feelings from the thoughts and to look for the evidence that they were true. And mm-hmm. what would a panel of scientists say? You know, where's the mm-hmm. evidence? You know, and is this a thought or is this a feeling and stuff like that? You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it was really interesting because the whole responsibility thing was very key because by the end of it, most of these women would, they would really get it that they had been like a twig in a hurricane. They, yeah. they, they weren't responsible for anything that had happened. Yeah, they were there, mm-hmm. uh, but they aren't the one that made the choice to do the bad things that happened, whether they were a mother and had responsibilities for mothering. They didn't have any control over what somebody else did. And they, and when, when you get to that point where you actually can think that clearly and you can remember only what you knew then, Mm -hmm. not everything you've learned since then. Mm. And you don't go back and put your 40 year old head on your 20 year old body. Right then you're in a much healthier place. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that was that was a really, uh, I learned a lot uh, doing that work. Um, and then when I worked with women who were in uh, full-time treatment for substance use issues, you know, most of them had been abused too. You know, we know mm-hmm. uh, that, that, you know, with one out of three women being abused and women who... Just started hearing music in my ear. I think it was. Sorry, I think I forgot to turn my phone completely off. But um, I, I. So I feel like really that I've learned most of everything I've learned. I've learned from survivors. You know, mm-hmm. it hasn't been book learning, and I'm not a clinician, as right. you know. You know, right. but I feel like we can learn everything we need to know from survivors because they're the experts on their life. That's right. Which is why they're the the ones who know what they need to, what they need to do. They're the ones who know what they need. Uh, We don't, and Mm -hmm. we can just be with them Mm -hmm. in their process. Mm -hmm. So as far as the, you know, having PTSD or really bad anxiety because of the trauma. That's so, I mean, I think normalizing it is really, really important. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. remember taking the big DSM manual, diagnostic yeah. statistical manuals, that thick, real heavy, you know, mm-hmm. and I would take it, I would just sort of drop it on my desk and go, what do you think is the one diagnosis in here that comes from the outside in? <laughs> you know? right. right. PTSD, because yeah. first thing, a criterion is, you know, something happens to you, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you're not crazy. And I think a lot of times uh, we feel crazy mm-hmm. uh, because well, the well, symptoms. Yeah, and women will will look bipolar. They'll even get diagnosed with bipolar. Oh, all the time. Very common if you're dealing with a narcissistic abuser. And Very by abuser, so. that also, that's an intimacy partner um, that's that's somehow or another controlling you it doesn't mean that they're hitting you like it's it's right. harder with the verbal abuse because there there are no bruises but if you can imagine exactly. what they're saying to you being bruises yeah i i have never met a survivor who said the physical abuse was the worst and mm-hmm. let me tell you i have heard every kind of yeah. horrific thing there is but everyone says that it was the the way they were terrorized, the way mm-hmm. they were humiliated, the way mm-hmm. they were um, stripped of their dignity and their uh, their sense of self right. and their 
freedoms. Mm -hmm. It's always much worse. So, what what have you, know, you, see, I, what have you seen with? Because I there's a there's a pattern of codependency, a codependent with a narcissist, an empath with a narcissist, and mm -hmm. and just seeing people struggle with people pleasing, codependency, or what's also now known as a fawning, a trauma response. Yeah, of of helping people with that. Well, uh, I don't think that uh, as far. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think there's any place for talking about codependency when it comes to domestic violence mm. because it's 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 really should be left in the realm of substance use. I believe right. that's what that's how where it was created and what it's for. Mm. I think in domestic violence, we're talking more like hostage dynamics, talking right. about maybe trauma bonding, which yes. can be both biological and psychological, and it's because of fear and mm -hmm. it's because of the way in which. Uh, the the victim has been essentially brainwashed and bonded to their abuser because they've run everybody else off and there's and that's the one person who's left in their life and they have to focus on them and see the world through their eyes. If they don't, they're going to get hurt. And mm -hmm. so they start to uh, defend them and lie mm -hmm. for them and do all kinds of things for them. Uh, but it's survival dynamics. Mm -hmm. It's not codependency because... Mm -hmm. uh, because it's done out of, uh, they're under threat and mm -hmm. they're, ha they're doing it to survive. So I'm not saying that I don't think there's a lot of great stuff you could get from codependency work. Like I love Melody Beatty. In fact, right. her book, uh, Codependent the language of, letting go, yeah. <laughs> language of letting go, I bet I've been through a bazillion copies and mm -hmm. given a bazillion away. There's good stuff there. Mm -hmm. But I think you, when we're talking about intimate partner abuse, we're talking about danger. We're talking about violence we're talking about psychological hostage taking mm -hmm. stripping someone of their identity it's not the same thing as codependency in my mind the other thing i would say is i don't think all abusers or even most abusers are narcissists i think mm. a lot of them have narcissistic tendencies right certainly uh they they're selfish because it's all about them but i think that we have to be cautious about conflating uh, narcissism and domestic abuse that domestic violence offenders do because uh, to what I am learning from survivors is that a lot of times when they are so focused in on narcissism, they're really focusing on the abuser more than themselves. Mm -hmm. it's, it's become such a yeah, and you, you know this, you're there, and you hear it all the time. It's mm -hmm. become like a buzzword, right? Mm -hmm. Narcissistic mm -hmm. abuse, narc abuse, narcopaths, all of that. It really, um, I, I feel like it's a distraction. I think that as survivors, we need to focus on ourselves and not on our abusers because it really doesn't matter why they do what they do. Matters mm -hmm. is that we need to focus on our safety mm -hmm. and we need to do everything we can to be safe and to act in our long term best interests. And uh, as long as we're focused on the abuser, then it really takes, it, it, we're not able to do what we need to do, which is focus on ourselves. And uh, that's why I think the gray rock theory, you know, the gr doing, being a gray rock, you're probably familiar with mm -hmm. that idea, right? So that you're, you just disengage with the person. Mm -hmm. So you don't give them any, you don't, you don't feed the narcissist or the abuser. Right whichever one they are, or if they're both, you know, but uh, focusing on the abuser is probably the biggest stumbling block for survivors in their healing. Mm. It's very hard to let go. It's very painful, especially if you're really traumatically bonded. And uh, it's been like a hostage situation mm -hmm. because losing him means losing yourself. Mm -hmm. Because he's taken everything from you, and now you're just, and you become what, what he sees. You see, and you see through his eyes. So losing him is is losing yourself. And even if you can leave, you don't. Right. And all of those uh, biochemical reactions from the constant anxiety and uh, chaos and uh, trauma become feel to start to feel normal, and to not have them anymore. Uh, 
when, when you leave your abuser or you're separated from your abuser can make you feel not normal, you know, because it's very feelings uncomfortable. and yes. those physiological reactions feel normal. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's so much unlearning that we have to do. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, Unlearning all this toxic thinking that, you know, the the garbage that the abusers put in our heads, but it's also getting back in touch with our bodies and learning where the trauma lives in us, in a way. Mm -hmm. But more than anything, and I always stress this, more than anything, we have to focus on safety. Mm -hmm. And this is why um, I believe that the best thing for a survivor of domestic violence or intimate partner abuse uh, to do is go to a support group with other survivors Mm -hmm. that is facilitated by someone who really understands domestic violence because it's not like other things. It is deadly. It does increase in frequency and severity. Mm -hmm. People get killed. Well, and that is, that is why, you know, that, and I know you've been a part of this and know of this, like there are certain groups in Charlotte that are for survivors and they don't meet the same place twice. Well, and and there's, there's good reason for that. Uh, And people who know, who understand this issue in in all its (laughs) complexities, or at least have a sophisticated understanding of it, we can't understand it all, but, uh, know that safety has to be the focus. So you mm-hmm. never advertise where you're going to have a support group, for example. Right. That's a That's no-brainer. Right. Right. Uh, and having a safety plan is critical. Mm-hmm. And that it's, it's literally a written plan for what you're going to do when and if you're in crisis or you're in danger. Because we don't think clearly when mm-hmm. we're activated that way. When right. we're in crisis, but knowing where we're going to go, who we're going to call, wh- how we're going to get away, and a- all of those things, having a real plan in place, and I think it's in some ways uh, survivors they don't want to focus on safety because it's too scary, mm. and they, uh, and also a lot of survivors I have found they won't admit that they're afraid because they think it means they're weak. Mm. But it, it, that's not what it's about. It's just a fact. You either are safe or you aren't. This person's right. either dangerous to you or they're not, right. you know. And right. if they are, then uh, we really have to do whatever we can for ourselves to be safe because nobody else is going to keep us safe. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't mm-hmm. count on the police. You can't count on a restraining order. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do all of that stuff. And it might make it better. It might make it worse. It might not do anything, but really it's up to us. And so we have to, it it helps to have that support from other people who are going through it. Mm -hmm. Because if I go and I I talk with a therapist, that's very helpful for certain things, Mm -hmm. dealing with the trauma, dealing with the aftermath, the triggers, all Mm -hmm. of that. But I also need information about my legal rights, about Mm -hmm. uh, my legal options, about shelters, about services for my kids that are very specific to having been in this situation and 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 to the um, the beliefs that Mm -hmm. have been passed down and. Uh, because really, that's what it is. I mean, mm-hmm. abusers abuse because they believe they have the right to do it. They, It's all about entitlement. It's not because they have an anger problem. It's not mm-hmm. because that's they right. use or drink. Mm-hmm. It's not because uh, it's not because they had a bad childhood. I mean, so, those things may be true, but those are correlates. Those aren't mm-hmm. causative. A person makes a decision to if they're going to uh, treat a partner this way. Mm. They're not out of control. And this is the one thing that I think is the hardest thing for survivors to really grasp and, and, and victims to people who are in it because it's so horrible to think that somebody who says they love you would actually do this on purpose. But mm-hmm. they have the option of walking out that door every time instead of saying that or doing mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. or abusing. They 
do have the control. And it's all about control. Mm-hmm. We know that because they don't do it everywhere. Right. You know, right. if they did it to police officers and judges in court, well, it would be one thing. But no, it, they hide it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you can't do that if you're really sick. You can't hide it. If I got a cold, I'm going to sneeze around everybody. If I've got cancer, <laughs> it's going everywhere with me. Right. That's not right. true with domestic violence. And so I think getting over, realizing that a lot of that stuff that we see is the good stuff or what used to be called the honeymoon. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. there was a theory for a long time that Dr. Lenore Walker came up with and it was helpful we don't use it anymore but it was the the couple spends a lot of time in tension and then there's an explosion and afterward mm-hmm. there's a honeymoon period well we don't use it anymore because we know now it's more of a uh continuum mm-hmm. the, the abuse never stops there's always abuse going on of some sort right, you might right. not be getting hit but you're he's controlling the money or he's telling you mm-hmm. where you can go and who you can be friends with what to wear you know, wow. he's doing whatever he wants, but you can't do what you, all of that. So, but the important thing about it is that part that we called the honeymoon, it really is more abuse. It's manipulation. It's mm-hmm. after something really bad has happened, the abuser is desperate to not lose you. So mm-hmm. victims get angry. They pull away. That's when they call the police or they, or they uh, leave, mm-hmm. you know, separate or whatever. And then the abuser, a lot of times, at least in the early stages of the relationship, will beg and cry, promise to never do it again. I'm going to go to counseling. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to do this and this. Again. And then it starts right up again. And it's just mm-hmm. over and over and over and over. That's because it's just another form of manipulation and abuse. It's not genuine. It's what I call manipulative kindness. Mm-hmm. It's very purposeful and it mm-hmm. works great. And because victims are for the most part really nice loving people they want to believe that and mm-hmm. they care about that person they they don't want that person to ruin his well, they don't want him to ruin his life they don't want mm-hmm. to deprive him of his children mm-hmm. and so they will keep giving him the benefit of doubt and focus it on him how can i help him how can i help him get help how can i help mm-hmm. him change where am i going to send him and that hamster wheel is a is a huge trap because the whole time you're doing that and you're focusing on why he's doing what he's doing and how I can help him not do it anymore, then it's getting more dangerous. It's increasing in frequency and severity. Mm-hmm. And so uh, actually this has been borne out in research. Jacobson and Gottman uh, were two sociologists at the University of Washington and they wrote a great book called When Men Batter Women. And they were studying couples that were having marital distress And they brought them into the lab and they hooked them up to all this equipment to measure their physiological Mm. reaction, you know, heart rate, blood pressure, sweat. And when they started to have exchanges and and arguments, they would see what happens, you know, and look at what's happening with their bodies. Well, they learned that after this is a 10 year study, by the way, with 200 wow. couples. Wow. And they learned in each and every case it was domestic violence. Mm-hmm. In each and every case, the man was the abuser, which is interesting. They didn't know about domestic violence. They ended up learning about it and writing a book about it. But what was really interesting was they learned that it was not until the victim's pity for the abuser turned to contempt. Right. That they would leave. That's right. That's the final stage. Yes. Mm-hmm. But those who were married to the most dangerous ones, the really pathological ones, mm. they called them uh, cobras. The abusers fell out into two groups based on what their bodies did when they got upset. Mm-hmm. Cobras and they called them pit bulls. Pit bulls were the ones that were all activated. And the cobras were the ones that would coil down and wait to strike. They were the really mm. deadly, dangerous. They were like, I don't need you, bitch. Go on, you know. Mm. And whereas these guys were like, don't leave me, don't leave me, don't leave me. Well, it turns out that the cobras were more like what we would call a sociopath. You know, they were right. very, the most dangerous. And the, the victims didn't leave them because they believed that they would be killed. Right, sure. 
but they yeah. did, but the others did. So, you know, we don't get the opportunity to study abusers very much because they don't cooperate with us and they don't think anything's wrong with them. And yeah. the, the one feature they have in common more than anything else is that they're just like the guy next door. They're, they're, <laughs> they're just a normal person. Right. Right. And uh, we don't, that's not how we think, We you know, we think we would know, right? Mm-hmm. But you can't, you know, there's no way to know uh, who's an abuser, who isn't. Well, it even, it even goes back to what you said that, and, I've heard, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, that your dating period, your engagement with your ex-husband who almost killed you was uneventful. And on the night of the wedding, the beginning of the marriage, it starts happening. And I hear that. I mean, that's an incredible amount of self-control. Very much. And that's the evidence right there that they yeah. do have control because right. they choose when mm-hmm. and around whom and where they are going to do this. Right. My husband didn't act out around other people. Mm-hmm. He knew they wouldn't tolerate it. Right. But uh, I'll tell you something that I have found very helpful is abusers always push for quick sex. It is inevitable. Mm-hmm. They they want uh, uh, you you meet them and all of a sudden they're in love with you and they want to marry you and they want to move in with you and they want to have but they want to have sex with you. Well, this is how abusers operate. Mm-hmm. They yeah. know the way to get. They use intimacy to get sex. Right. And a lot of times as women, we use sex to get intimacy, right? Mm-hmm. Well, but so what happens is then when you get the chemically bonded to this person by having sex mm-hmm. and th- you don't really know them yet, if you, if you uh, don't take time to get to know them first. So one of the things that I often tell her, uh, women who are scared they're going to get in another abusive relationship is that, you know, they're just afraid of men a lot of times. Mm-hmm. I say, you, th- this is something that you can do. You, you withhold sex. You tell them, I may or may not ever have sex with you. Right. Because abusers are not going to tolerate that. Right. This is how sometimes you can find out if somebody is going to be an abuser because uh, they're not going to wait forever. Th- mm-hmm. These guys are going to push and push because they have to have their way. They can't be told no. They will mm-hmm. not have a woman tell them. Yeah. And so they will push your boundaries. They will uh, not respect your boundaries. The other thing that I tell them is um, it's very important early on uh, in a relationship or when you just meet somebody or dating them, whatever, uh, to create a little Harmless conflict. See how they handle not getting their way. Mm-hmm. Really important. Right. You know, uh, we last night we watched what you wanted to watch. Uh, mm-hmm. We watched a movie you wanted to see. Now I want to pick the movie tonight. Yeah. You know, just little stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Because people, guys who believe they're who are entitled mm-hmm. and uh, dominant, who believe they're superior, mm-hmm. and that they're the boss. That's really where they're coming from that they have the right and the responsibility to keep a woman in line, you know, yeah. not that it doesn't happen in, you know, lesbian, gay, mm. you know, trans relationship. It does. It does. Right, sure. But the abuser is always having to get their way and they can't fake it for too long. Mm-hmm. Once the abuse starts though, setting boundaries can be really, really dangerous. And so trying yeah. to, you know, I, I never suggest to a, uh, somebody who's in an abusive relationship start to set boundaries with them. You know, just stand your ground. No, that that could get you killed. That's not yeah. a good idea. Well, and I think that's such a good point of saying when you're dating someone, getting to know them, how do they respond to to a boundary? How do they respond to? I really want to go out with you tonight, but I have a headache. Can we? Can I catch you tomorrow? Or I want to go out with my girlfriends. Yeah. Or I'm not going to be. Uh, I'm not going to be able to see you this weekend. Right. They will not tolerate that. Right. They will be blowing up your phone like crazy. And that. Right. So there are. It's not that you can always tell who's going to be an abuser because a lot mm-hmm. of times they slip by you. They're mm-hmm. slick. They're good. Right. They're manipulative. They're actors. Mm-hmm. But you might be able to if you are pretty. You know, you're smart that way. Right. And. Uh, and just sit back and watch mm-hmm. and, you know, see if they can, you know, if they're going to respect your, your boundaries and 
uh, not be too pushy. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's so important. The other thing I do want to throw out there is, you know, fawning is now better understood as, mm-hmm. you know, a trauma response. And that is I do things for you to try to please you so I can feel safe. And mm-hmm. so that can look like codependency. We now know is a trauma response, is a physiological response. And for people to understand if you're having to do things repetitiously so that yeah. you feel safe for the person, that right. that is that is a clear sign. Survival behavior. Survival. Back to what I was saying, you know, trauma yep. bonding. Yep. So somebody becomes traumatically bonded with the person who essentially does what terrorists do when they kidnap somebody. Mm-hmm. They deprive you of your basic needs. They mm-hmm. do small kindnesses here and there, that manipulative kindness thing, which kind of throws yeah. you off and makes you, you know, think they're not so bad. They, uh, they cause you to violate your moral code. So, the the way in which w- we get bonded to our abusers has a lot to do with how isolated we are mm-hmm. with them and also how dangerous they are. Yeah. So there's no shame in being traumatically bonded. It doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. It means right. you're a survivor. Mm-hmm. It's normal. That's what you do because mm-hmm. you don't, right. you can get killed. Right. Things will get a lot worse. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that you're an enabler or any mm-hmm. of that kind of stuff. It just means you're your survivor. So survival behavior. But mm-hmm. the bad thing about it, Kim, and you know this, is that when we do survival behavior, then people look at us and go, oh, my God, look at her. You know, mm-hmm. she's drinking. She yep. hits her kids. She's screwing around with this guy here because she met a nice guy who treats her well. You know, uh, she she yells at him because she's trying to stand up for herself. So all of these things are misunderstood. And Mm -hmm. they're done out of fear and resentment. They're normal survival behaviors. They're not power and control, which is what he's doing. But they might look the same from the outside looking in. Right. You know? Yeah. He yells, she yells. Right. He hits the kids, she hits the kids. He drinks, she drinks, whatever. It's not the same thing. It's right. very yeah. different, and law enforcement and others don't always get that, and that's why victims get blamed so much mm-hmm. because of, oh, you know, look at her. Oh, my God, she yells at him. She doesn't sleep with him. Uh, she smells like alcohol. You know, no wonder he beats her. Yeah, right. That's what people think. Yeah. Well, and I think it's so important that what you're saying right now, if, for, if no one hears anything else in this, to hear you being so clear about the victim blaming and that – People do a lot of things, just like people who go to prison. They do things yeah. they never thought they would do yes. to to survive in that moment. You go work for a corporation. You start doing things you yeah. never thought you would do. And to use that, people stay in jobs they absolutely can't stand. Use that to have some empathy for people who are in a relationship. Right. Think about yeah. how hard it is to stop smoking. Stop yeah, or leave a job or to, find a new to, yeah, church. To, yeah, just leave a a bad relationship that's not dangerous. I mean, it's mm-hmm. when you you layer on top of that the danger and the fear and the traumatic bonding and all of mm-hmm. all and, and the ways in which the system often sides with the abuser instead yes. of the victim. Well, it's no wonder that they stay. A lot of mm-hmm. victims have to make the choice to stay in their abusive relationship because they know if they fight for custody, they're going to lose. Right. And most of them actually do if there's a custody right. battle, unfortunately. That's how the family mm-hmm. courts are really uh, mm-hmm. slanted these days. So victims, you know, it's not our job to get people to leave their abusers. It's right. it's our it, – oh, all we need to do is what I said before. Mm-hmm. We believe them, we support them, and we refer them, you know, and we always – let the victim or survivor make the decision about what she's going to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we stand with her. It may not be what we think she should do, right. but we don't want to alienate someone. So if somebody decides they're going to stay with their abuser, we're not going to say, well, I wash my hands with you. You know, don't come back to me anymore. No, that's the worst thing you could do because the abuser is trying to isolate her from everybody. And then he wins. Right. So what you 
what you want to do is just remember it's not that's not your job. That's not your role. That shouldn't be your focus. Your focus is just provide support mm-hmm. and uh, information. Right. And yeah, I think that's, resources. That's, Always yeah. be there. Yeah. The resources stand by somebody. I think that's so important. I, I just thank you for this. Thank you so much for repurposing. Oh. Um, I really enjoyed talking with you, Kim. Yeah, I could was, talk. I mean, I did most of the talking, okay, but <laughs> were you supposed next time to? I want to hear more from you because you're such a fascinating person too, and cool. you have such a good heart. And I really appreciate everything that you're doing. I know. I and, appreciate that so much. I'm going to put you in the hot seat for one minute. Okay. And so you're in the therapy hot seat. I'm going to ask yeah. you a few questions and just whatever comes to mind real quick, you're going to answer those. Sure. Um, and then we'll help make sure people can get in touch with you. But again, thank you so much for your expertise with this. All right. Absolutely. Okay. First word that comes to mind when you hear the word vulnerable. Oh, uh, Brene. <laughs> yeah, Brene Brown. <laughs> Brene Brown. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's she the teaches us. Yes, she yes, teaches us about vulnerability. Yeah, 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 which is the antidote of shame. Thank you for that. That's so good. <laughs> I love that. It's my favorite answer so far. All right, favorite Bible verse. Wow. Oh, Micah 6 a do justice, mm. love mercy, mm-hmm. walk humbly with your God. Yeah, especially with your testimony. That's perfect. What's the most normal thing about you? <sighs> Probably that I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> You don't sound lazy. <laughs> well, I know it, but yeah. you know, there's a part of me that really is that yeah. doesn't want to do anything, that doesn't right. want to work, you know? And uh, <laughs> um, I love yeah. that. That's great. <laughs> All right. Your favorite binge worthy show? Oh, wow. It depends on the week. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I just watched one. Uh, oh, what was the name of that one? We ju- I mean, I, I just binge watch this whole season of something but i really i i really like the one that is um uh excuse me a minute i'm sorry uh i'm i apologize somebody's it's at the door um I, I like the one that is uh the marvelous mrs mazel uh-huh. you know you know about the jewish comedian right it's wonderful but uh, there's so many others. I've been watching one called Virgin River. But my really my favorite one is Outlander. I have to admit, I kind of love Jamie. <laughs> yeah, that is great. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. I love you. Will you please tell our audience how would they get in touch with you? Website? Oh, or Facebook? absolutely. Yeah, sure. Well, a lot of people follow me on Facebook, and I do a lot of education on Facebook. So you're welcome to join me there, and you'll just find me. I've got several different pages. Just my name, Julie Owens, Violence Against Women Consultant, something mm-hmm. like that. My website is domesticviolenceexpert.org. Yeah, and I have a lot of FAQs, frequently asked questions. There's videos. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of information. So yeah, you know, feel free to contact me if you want to. Um, I yeah, just please. really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to get to talk with survivors. I mean, I think survivors mm-hmm. are the most amazing people in the whole world. And mm-hmm. they're, uh, anybody who has survived awful stuff and come out the other side, especially like you, Kim, you know, mm-hmm. helping other people. Right. right. Yeah. As they say, walking through the fire and that can't come out carrying buckets of water. That's right. You know? I love that. Yeah. That's an amazing thing. You know, it is. Well, it's definitely who you are as well. So, really, thank you. And to all of you who heard this, I know you've heard something today that flipped your lid and that you've heard something as well that will allow you to reconnect and be who God has called you to be. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Lid with Kim Honeycutt. Please subscribe, rate, and share. You can find Kim on Facebook or Instagram at KB Honeycut. To get an autographed copy of Kim's book, visit butyourmotherlovesyou.com. Remember, no matter what, treat yourself well today. <laughs>